Hello, and welcome back to the Darknet Demystified. I'm your host, Sam Bent, aka Doing Fed Time, and today we're going to discuss some current events. We're going to talk about the Feds having trash OPSEC to the point of being unable to come up with even a halfway decent password, and why chat GPT malware, you know, at the end of the day, really doesn't matter. We're also going to talk about a recent article detailing how a police department got owned and the details, you know, of how they got put on the dark net. And we'll wrap everything up with my personal favorite story in regards to the police getting owned, which is just so happens to be something that actually happened about an hour away from where I live, which to me is probably one of the funniest, you know, police getting owned stories that I've heard. Um, that I can remember uh, in a long time. So let's get to it. So first off, I have a ton of RSS feeds set up for many different sites that are out there. Basically, I went to Google Alerts and found sites that I liked, you know, or like ones that produce pretty interesting or halfway decent content or news stories that I found good. And then I used, you know, Google Alerts to set up a Google alert when they put out new content, if that makes sense. Once I have these Google alerts set, I have them, you know, basically set as RSS feeds. Now, because they're set as RSS feeds, I can take them and I can plug them into an RSS feed reader in my web browser. So anytime a story or new content comes up about a specific thing or on a specific site, I get an alert that lets me know about that. This is, you know, it's pretty dope. So like if at the end of the day, you want to know, you know, when a news story comes out about, I don't know, Shaquille O'Neal, right? Like you can set that up as a Google alert and you will be notified if that name is mentioned Um, and you'll get an alert to it on your RSS feed. So it's, it's really, it's, it's a pretty good way of being able to monitor the internet for specific things that you might be interested in or like, you know, you're looking into or you're, you know, you want to monitor on a regular basis. Like if you're trading in, you know, crypto, you might be interested to have a, you know, an alert on say Bitcoin or something, you know? Um, Anyways, most of the sites that I have this set up on, like don't have RSS feeds. So this is like my way of creating them so that I can monitor the latest news on, you know, different topics and industries, like, you know, almost in real time. So the other day I got an alert from one of these sites, you know, on which I have one of those RSS feeds set up. There's an article uh, with the, the title was like, Deserialized Web Security or Web Security Roundup or something like that, which, like highlighted Slack, uh, Okta security breaches. And the last thing, which, you know, really caught my eye was the, you know, US, weak US government passwords, you know? So, so naturally I had to click on it and, you know, go to it and check it out. So like I said, like my primary interest was mainly in like the latter part of the title, which, you know, was the weak governmental passwords. Uh, I know for a fact that, you know, a ton of U.S. government agencies use trash, you know, passwords that are just horrible. Um, And I'll get into that in a YouTube video sometime, but um, it's always fun to like hear them talk about like that from their own standpoint uh, to, you know, like get that statistical data and to understand how like incredibly lazy government employees are as a whole uh and it's like now that i actually said that out loud it's like (laughs) i just absolutely solidified my reputation as a nerd with that statement (laughs) fun statistical data that wow that's a bad hit okay uh moving on so going through the final report some things like really struck me as pretty nuts even for like you know the lazy ass federal government employees that are out there. So I'll definitely clarify. Um, So there was a, you know, this test that was done by the United States Department of the Interior. And I know a ton of people who are going to be like, you know, if I actually had this conversation with them, like would be saying something like, 
you know, who cares about the Department of the Interior? They, you know, manage public land and materials and, you know, national parks and you know, just crap like that, you know, wildlife refuges. And like, you know, the fact of the matter is that at the end of the day, even if there, you know, was nothing to glean in terms of like valuable information, um, that isn't true. Uh, you would still have a foothold in a federal agency. Um, one of the quotes in the article uh, that the report, you know, had was from Forbes, which discussed, you know, ransomware attacks on the Colonel pipeline. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, which, you know, they, they were quoted as saying, effectively shut down half of the country's fuel supply chain by stealing one password, unquote. I think if I was a ransomware attacker, uh, it's a pretty safe bet that at the end of the day, the people who own, you know, that hardware are definitely going to be paying, you know, damn near whatever I ask uh, to, to get something like that back up and running. <laughs> now, like, while we're discussing this, keep in mind that this whole test that they ran wasn't some, you know, hardcore vulnerability assessment. Like, it wasn't some in-depth covert pen test like they didn't use any exploits like literally all they did was crack passwords you know from my understanding anyways it's like like you know loading up john the ripper or something else and just brute forcing a ton of passwords uh the report said that within the first 90 minutes of testing they had cracked the passwords for 16 percent of the department's user accounts in addition they also said that the department had yet to consistently implement basic things like multi-factor authentication, which is included in the 89% of their high value assets. Awesome. <laughs> they also stated that they had found that 4.75% of all active user account passwords, wait for it, were based on the word password. <laughs> uh, it's rich. They didn't even disable inactive or unused accounts or implement any age limits for passwords. In turn, this left an additional 6,000 active accounts vulnerable to attack. Those statistics definitely speak for themselves. I mean, I remember scrolling through the report and getting to like the point where they had like their recommendations and like I, I just wish it had like just said like two words in bold you know like the words smarten up <laughs> that would have been awesome uh you know they it just would have been hilarious uh it does beg the question though of like you know how bad the opsec is of every other department and like government agency that exists Anyone that's, you know, been in the hacking scene for any amount of time will definitely tell you that at the end of the day, you know, we've heard tons of stories about like, you know, the 12 year old, the 14 year old who, you know, breaks into NASA or some other, you know, governmental agency that's, you know, thought to be secure and like nine times out of 10, it's not, you know, with some advanced zero day attack, but like instead, you know, with Nmap and some like totally noobish attack. And like at the end of the day, for, for those of you like who aren't, you know, as much of a nerd as I am, like a zero day is basically when someone discovers a vulnerability and no one else knows about it. Um, you know, when you have an exploit that can exploit a, a particular vulnerability, that's a zero day. Uh, it's it's that exploit, you know, it's like if you know how to card a door, for example, you know, you use a credit card, pop your, your front door. Um, but like no one else has ever heard of this, this particular vulnerability indoors. You, you, that card would be your exploit, right? And you would leverage it against, you know, that particular vulnerability of, you know, the door. Uh, anyway, so... Like, you know, moving on to the next topic, I've, I've heard a ton of people more or less, you know, flipping out over the last couple of days, you know, when discussing things like chat GPT, you know, and the, the malware that it's been writing. Now, many people, and, you know, from my assumption, mostly the uneducated or like unindoctrinated in information security and cybersecurity, 
see this as like a massive and, and wild threat. And there, you got a ton of people who, you know, know better. Um, and they're still making a big deal out of it just because it gets views um, on YouTube. You know, hysterics and, and fear mongering just it tends to do that. Um, so the reality is at the end of the day, like anyone, including like your average person can go get malware or ransomware for that matter as a service if they know how to use Google well. I mean, it's not something that takes a whole lot of ingenuity or abilities at all. You know, the hysteria centered around the whole concept of people using, you know, AI to create malware to me is just ridiculous. And, you know, I'll tell you why. At the end of the day, CISA, just it's C-I-S-A, um, which stands for the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, which is a, it's a, it's a governmental agency, you know, and be like, oh, you're just bashing the feds, like, like, but anyways, they, they estimate that on average, something like 80% of malware that takes place, you know, in the K to 12 educational spheres is done with Microsoft Excel macros 4.0. <laughs> which, by the way, came out in 92, you know, um, like in other words, people are still clicking on macros, even though Windows is warning them that it could be extremely dangerous to do this 30 years later. Are you kidding me? Like, we are still having people install malware the way they did in the 90s and it's still working. Like, we don't need AI to write us malware <laughs> because people are still gullible enough to run things that they shouldn't be running, you know? Um, people are still gullible enough to click on links that they don't know uh, or aren't familiar with. Um, people are still, you know, giving away way too much information, you know, on the phone systems. So at the end of the day, like, you know, none of... You know, none of these things are things that are ever going to change. Like, we can inform people, but at the end of the day, like, you're never going to have 100% security, you know, regardless. Um, I've said this in you know, some of my videos before, and, uh, you know, it just, it it doesn't exist. It's, it's again, it's like a honest politician or a sharp marble. It's like, you know, um, just a fairy tale. Okay, so... You know, getting back to the the matter at hand, um, I remember this kind of hysteria like on multiple different occasions. You know, right like right off the bat, I remember like when SET came into existence. Uh, it's S E T, um, and you know, for those of you who are not well versed in information security or hacking, this is like an acronym for a tool that came out called the Social Engineering Toolkit. Um, and like it could do a ton of you know different tasks and uh, can automate some attacks that before then yeah you know, they weren't they weren't automated like you had to you had to do them by hand um, so it made it kind of streamlined the workflow of a penetration test or a hack uh, just made it a little bit easier so like when I say uh, it can do like a variety of tasks like one of the ones that I'm speaking of like specifically are things like generating malicious payloads or doing mass nefarious emailing campaigns. And to like take that out of nerd speak, like you could use the social engineering toolkit to say, create a virus that you can put on a DVD or a CD or a flash drive. And like, you know, when someone plugs that in, uh, you would then, for example, like get remote access to their computer. Um, and this is like, you know, one type of attack that you know you would see inside of the social engineering toolkit there's tons of different ones I mean, that's just one I just thought it would, it would replicate websites almost instantly and like host a phishing site like it was, it was a it's a absolutely beautiful tool uh written by david kennedy um and you should definitely check it out if you have time anyways alternatively like I can also generate things like malicious PDFs that you could put into like, you know, scam emails and, you know, you, you could try to get someone to open that PDF, you know, and if they did open it, like you could infect their computer. And, you know, if you're talking about doing this to a company, then you just bypassed, 
a lot of layers of security uh, that was probably carefully laid out. Um, and like, this is a very generalized and very like dumbed down um, example, but it's very simple to create these things, you know, and put them into attacks with things like the social engineering toolkit. You know, so basically all you had to do is enter in a letter or a number out of a menu, you know, to do a particular attack, you know. So at the end of the day, like you could pick an attack off a menu, like, you know, you're picking out a burger and a fast food joint, you know, then the attack would be carried out exactly, you know, like that's how the social engineering toolkit worked is literally just make a selection, you know, um, and it allowed people to easily use various tools and like some really badass frameworks like, you know, the Metasploit framework to easily create effective ways of, you know, red teaming or attacking. Um, obviously, like this wasn't like the first time this was ever done, but people did freak out because of how easy you know it was to be able to do these kind of things um and you know that, that makes sense you know just it made it simple so that everyone could now go and create malicious payloads or you know send 500 emails to a, a fortune 500 company that that were all you know had had the, all this you know had like a an evil pdf in it or an evil doc in it or whatever you know that was that was inside of it in order to exploit that network and and to be able to connect to it um then there are also people who like freaked out when the Wi-Fi pineapple came out and like the Wi-Fi pineapple did like a whole bunch of different attacks, but you know, the majority of them were local and, you know, mainly had to do with Wi-Fi networks. And I love the Wi-Fi pineapple. I like two different iterations of it, but um, I'm not going to get too much, you know, into that. If you don't know about it, something you should definitely Google to just to educate yourself. Um, super powerful hacking tool, physical hacking tool. Um, and definitely, you know, in my opinion, worth the money. But basically, it's like, you know, when your computer, like, say you get a laptop or a tablet, whatever, like, you go and you turn that on, it tries to connect to, like, your Wi-Fi, you know, and does this automatically with time. So it's like, you know, it'll hop on, and what it does is it's like, imagine, like, I'm the computer. I would be like, hey, you know, is, is Netgear 521 here? And like, if that's my home router, and if my home router is in the area, it'll be like, yeah, I'm right here. Then they establish and they make a connection. And like, that's more or less how it works. So like, if you have multiple different, you know, wireless access points that you connect to, that's basically more or less in a you know, very, again, very simplified approach, but that's kind of how your laptop or devices connect to Wi-Fi spots. And, you know, they call the Wi-Fi pineapple, the, the you know, the other term for it is, is Yaziga. Um, and it's like Yaziga is German for yes man, from my understanding. Um, so basically what that means is like when you, when you go to connect to it, you go to connect to it and like your, your laptop or whatever is like, hey, are you XYZ access point? And the Wi-Fi pineapple is like, yes man, you know, <laughs> you can connect to me. Uh, and there's a ton of attacks that you could actually execute once you get to that point. So it's that's you know one of the things that makes it a very effective tool. Um, that said, my favorite tool by Hack Five, and I have to throw this one out there. Um, and they're not sponsoring this. Like I don't I don't get anything from them. Um, but the, my favorite tool that they make is called the Bash Bunny, and this thing is like. This is a device that was made and sold by Hack5. Um, again, like I'm not going to get into too much of what it does. It's I could literally do a four-hour podcast on just this, but it's an extremely powerful tool. Um, so, like to simplify it, distill it down into like a sentence and a half, it'd be like you know you can essentially plug this thing into a computer, and in seven seconds you can own that computer. Like you can have a virus installed in that computer that you can use to access the computer remotely. Um, like the computer can be locked and you can still, you can pull passwords off of it. It's, it's just super powerful. Um, so people tend to freak out about, you know, almost any new, really interesting kind of hacking tool. But after you see something, you know, like that so often, it tends to get really annoying. 
Um, and like at the end of the day, the crap code that like chat GPT creates sucks anyways. Um, like I would put the odds at extremely unlikely that you'll see someone who doesn't know how to write code, you know, go in and create something that's functional right off the rip, especially like when we're discussing something as, you know, low level as malware or ransomware or any of that stuff. Now, I know there have been articles where they've talked about people have done that. I'm not saying that they haven't. I'm just saying that it's fairly, it's going to be something that's fairly difficult to pull off um, and, and have it be you know done well. Now, again, I totally get there are articles where people have done it. I just, I'm saying at the end of the day, AI writing malware is not some revolutionary thing, you know? Um, in any case, like that's my two cents on the whole chat GPT generating malware meltdown that, you know, we've seen on YouTube and in a couple of articles for the last couple of days. It's basically like fear cells, you know? Um, and that's my big thing. It's like at the end of the day, it's like, you know, we don't need to be afraid if we if we if we know, you know. I think a lot of people feed off of that. I see I mean, I see that all the time. It's like, you know, the guy trying to sell the alarm system, you know, calls you up and and talks to you about crime statistics and B and E's in your area to, you know, try to get you to freak out and buy this product. And like I I mean, I love it when they when they call, uh, because like I'm I'm home all the time anyway. You know, you break into my house, I'm gonna be here. <laughs> so you're screwed. Um and the justifiable homicide laws in Vermont are like three sentences. I mean, they're super lenient, so you're you're probably gonna be screwed anyways. Um but like it's just it's it's crazy, man. I've, I've had them call and they've been like, oh, well, you know, they tell me about all these crime statistics. I'm like, well, OK, so I pay you a monthly fee and, you know, you make sure that, you know, I don't get broken into. Blah, blah, blah. And they're like, oh, yeah, like, you know, we will we, we'll keep you safe. You know, I'm like, man, that is so reminiscent of like the Italian mafia, you know. Like, you know, you know, it'd be a shame if someone threw a Molotov cocktail to the window because you didn't, you know, pay us our, you know, our, our due that we were asking this month, you know? I mean, it's just, that's that's kind of how it rubs me. It just, I just really hate that, you know? Um, it's like a lot of, you know, kind of change the topic, but like a lot of federal prison consultants um, that are out there do the same thing where it's like, you know, some poor bastard decided not to pay his taxes, 70 years old, and he's getting, you know, prosecuted by the federal government, the IRS, you know? Uh, cause he messed with him and wouldn't pay him cause he's cheap. Uh, he was a millionaire, but he, like, he doesn't want to pay his taxes. So like at the end of the day, they prosecute him and you know, this, this dude is, is going to jail and he's scared to death cause he's not a, he's not like a, a real criminal. You know, the guy's not a hardcore drug trafficker or anything like that, but you know, he's going to federal prison. Like he, he has this notion of federal prison you know, where like he thinks he's going to go there and he's going to get raped and it's going to be like, you know, dudes are, dudes are, you know, stabbing each other every day. It's like this dude's going to a minimum security prison camp. You know, it's going to be a joke. Um, like it's really, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not anything, you know, this isn't, we're not talking about a medium or a United States penitentiary, a high security facility, or even a medium security facility. You know, you're talking about a, a daycare more or less, you know, I mean, you have fights and stuff and, and and those places but it's not you know no one's no one's there's no riots you know people aren't cutting each other's heads off with dental floss you know what i mean like it's it's not you know but but you have these guys who will kind of sell that image to these these dudes and they will get you know twenty thousand fifty thousand a hundred thousand dollars out of them through fear mongering through just scaring the crap out of them or allowing society's ideas of what prison are to do that to them um, and these guys prey on, on those kind of people. And anyways, like I started, you know, being a federal prison consultant because I basically wanted to kill the business that they were doing, you know, the money they were making from extorting people. And like, I just don't have the time for it. You know, I'm too busy making YouTube videos about the dark net and, you know, do trying to build a master class on it and writing books about you know, how to get yourself out of prison. And like, I just don't, I, I just didn't have the time for it. So like, you know, one of my future projects is going to be um, essentially going in and gathering up everything I know, everything I can find, and putting it all together to create a 
you know, kind of a master section where I have, you know, all of this data broken down and organized. And that person who wants to know, you know, what's the federal prison going to be like for me? Where What's my security level going to be? You know, how's this work? How's that work? That person can, in turn, go there and find literally any answer that they're looking for. And this completely robs the, you know, for-profit federal prison consultants um, that extort people with fear out of their their ability to do that, you know? But, like, that's why originally I was going to... That's where doing fed time exists originally. Um, But, like, as I started to get... Like, I started off, like, oh, I'm just going to do... I'm going to consult, but I'm going to consult way cheaper. And I'm just like, man, I don't have time for that. Like, I'm better off just creating a non-profit and putting all the information together and putting it up like that and just trying to take these guys out of business that way, you know? Um, it's just one of the things I'm, I'm also, you know, going back and forth on one of my side projects. Anyways, I digress. Let's move on to the next thing. So several news outlets are reporting that San Francisco Bay Area Rapid Transit or BART police files have been hacked and released onto the dark net a uh, reputable and well-established ransomware group, Vice Society, is claiming responsibility for the hack. The group's goal is to exchange the stolen data for ransom payments by breaking into hospitals, schools, and like other institutions. According to NBC News, the hack includes 120,000 internal BART files, largely likely those of Human Resources Department and, quote, containing specific complaints of child abuse, unquote. The data also includes email addresses, passwords, names, driver's licenses of various BART contractors, hiring documentation for BART police applicants, and mental health records for officers submitted for mental health exams, which no doubt is probably thousands of pages long. Obviously, Bard thought it wouldn't be a good idea to pay the ransom, you know, considering the fact that they're online now. Uh, now, you know, at the same time, Bard is, you know, claiming that the, you know, hack won't have any kind of impact on ridership. But, you know, by doing that, like they, you know, are admitting that it did happen. So, you know, to be clear, neither the internal business systems nor Bard services have been harmed according to Alicia Trost, a BART spokesman, which, you know, we absolutely know that the spokesperson never lies. You know, they are always (laughs) 1,000%. Oh, man, it's an absolute joke. However, the hack appears to be more serious than the 2011 BART Police Officers Association breach by hackers associated with Anonymous. More than 100 officers' email addresses, passwords, and personal information were exposed in that 2011 attack. Suppose BART police have even issued a citation against you for a crime. In that case, there is probably such information among the data that was released. Additionally, at least six scanned Unredacted reports outlying suspected child abuse were among the files, which includes the names and birth dates of the children who are in danger, and as well as descriptions of the adults who, again, absolutely outstanding OPSEC, you know, by our government, whether it's federal or local, these guys, you know, they absolutely lead by example. <laughs> Really great opposite, guys. You know, keep up the great work. You know, by the way, this agency is comprised of like 300 people. So from my understanding, like 200 of them are actually cops in, you know, in terms of being like sworn law enforcement. So with that said, you know, it's like at the end of the day, like on BART.gov, they say that they're hiring and offering like $15,000 sign-on bonuses, which is absolutely insane. You know, instead of hiring more transit cops, 
to issue tickets and, you know, extort the public. You know, maybe they should hire an IT guy or 10, you know, considering that they had a $2.4 billion budget get passed in 2020, according to the Bay Area NBC news coverage. You, know, you would think that they could afford to keep the identities of kids and, you know, other victims safe at the very least. You know, never mind what they're charging people on a regular basis for, you know, whatever fines they're issuing uh, to, to various individuals, you know. Uh, but hey, you know, who cares about that? Like, you know, let the San Francisco PD, you know, start killing people with the robots. Like, yeah, it's a, it's a real thing, by the way. Go ahead and Google it. Um, like, this is why I'm glad that I live in Vermont sometimes. You know, it's, it's very it's sad, like, what's going on across the country. But at the end of the day, like, definitely. And like that said, you know, we definitely have our own problems up here, too. Um, but, you know, it just doesn't seem as drastic or, you know, as crazy as like, you know, some of the stuff that's going on in the rest of the country. So, for example, like I remember a story about this guy. I always thought he was a farmer who was getting his house taken. But like in doing my research, like I ended up finding out that it was just like a dude, like this dude got, so he gets arrested for cannabis, right? Like, yeah, like some, you know, he gets some cannabis, you know, he's smoking a blunt or whatever. Um, so this dude's, dude's name's Roger Pinnon, uh, P-I-O-N. Um, and it's all, it's all public information. I'm not, you know, dropping anyone's name. Um, so this guy, um, you know, gets arrested for, for weed, right? Um, and he's mad about it. You know, he's, He's mad that the, you know, the cops arrested him for cannabis. I don't, I don't blame him, you know, um, ethically, I would be <laughs> too. Uh, morally, you know, uh, it's a nonviolent crime. You get arrested for it. Totally can relate uh, on that level. But so he gets arrested for it. Um, and like his reaction might have been a little bit over the top. So like, you know, what roger decided to do um was to turn around and you know take a tractor and drive it down to the police station you know and be like oh what's wrong with that not illegal there um well then he ran over all of the cruisers in the park now like i don't know the exact number of cop cars that this guy ran over with his tractor um but it wasn't, it was like, it was, wasn't more than 20 and it wasn't less than four, you know? Um, so it's a good amount. I mean, like, dude, like you're, you're, you're hosting a, a friggin' monster truck rally um, in the back of a police station, right? And you're crushing these cars with a tractor, not with a monster truck that can, you know, at least go like, you know, whatever, 50 or whatever. You know, I don't know. Um, I'm assuming a monster truck drives faster than a tractor. I've never driven either, but it's an assumption. So anyways, like none of these morons put this together, you know, like this guy's out there crushing all of their vehicles with his tractor and these idiots just totally oblivious. Um, so there's actually a quote by the chief deputy, Philip Brooks, who says, we came out and sure enough, there was someone who had run over our cruisers with a tractor. <laughs> <laughs> you can't make this shit up, you know? <laughs> so, so, he goes, not only were their roofs and hoods caved in, but the radios were ruined, the radar detectors, the cages in the cars. We're going to have to get the jaws of life up here to pry the trunks open to see about the rifles and shotgun, said Sheriff Kirk Martin. <laughs> Uh, so like, you know, they take this guy, you know, um, and I think his, his bail was something like 50 grand or whatever, you know, they throw him in County and you know, he's pissed. Uh, but like they end up, you know, he pleads insanity. Um, and they end up referring him to like a mental hospital and then they're like, oh, he's competent. You know, he's competent to stand trial for what he did. So he gets in front and like, they, they're like, oh yeah, we're not gonna, we're not gonna pursue this. Like, cause, cause like this dude became like a rock star you know um in vermont anyways but like he made national news you know and it was like this big thing of like you know i, I originally thought the story was they it was he was a farmer and they took his house um and 
you know, he lost his house, so he flipped out and he ran over all these cop cars and, you know, like, the, but that was in the community. It must have been a different story, but it was just like, it was, it was, I got this story so mixed up and it just really blows my mind. So I was doing my research for this podcast because I don't want to put out false information out there. I only want to put out the truth. And in order to do that, you have to be able to document stuff. So like, you know, but I could have sworn when I, when I had originally heard the story, it was like, he had lost his house. The bank was taking his house. He freaked out ran over these cruisers, then they arrested him. And then I like, I remember reading about this dude, like getting his bail set and like the community raised his bail. They got him out and like the bank forgave the note. Um, and I'm just like, I just don't remember like what the hell, like what news story that was. I was trying to find that one. Um, so if anyone knows, like definitely let me know, but like, I just, I just couldn't put my finger on it, but uh, only in Vermont, you know, like the, how awesome is that, you know, but like in this case, like I said, um, they, they didn't end up prosecuting him, which I, again, I thought was awesome. You know, they, they're like, oh, he caused a quarter million dollars in damage. And I'm like, dude, it's like, you know, it's like, it's like six, you know, shitty ass Fords, you know, or, or whatever that he ran over. I mean, sure. Like the cages and, you know, the aftermarket stuff and, you know, maybe the shotgun or two, but like at the end of the day, man, I just, yeah, you know, and went from like a quarter of a million, like two hundred and fifty thousand, to three hundred thousand, and like it just you know they just love they love that you know they love blowing you way out of proportion, and uh, it just makes makes a really good you know kind of a news story that way. But anyways, I'm just jabbering on now. So I had a great time hosting this podcast, the second podcast. Um, I hope you guys also enjoyed it, um, and. Again, dying to know what you think. So if you guys can, you know, hop on YouTube. If you're listening to this, you know, on Amazon or on Spotify or on any of those other outlets where this podcast is hosted, there's a ton of them. Um, definitely, if you can, you know, make it to YouTube, go on to Doing Fed Time, um, that channel, and go to the playlist with the podcast and find this episode and, you know, leave a comment. Let me know what you thought. I look forward to reading them and I, I try to respond to almost every comment that I get. So with that, you guys stay safe, stay healthy, stay free.